Thank you. It is now time for a question period. The member from Nipissing. Thank you, and uh, good morning, uh, Speaker. Uh, as an homage to Mr. Cunningham's feistiness, I'll direct my question to the Premier. With last week's budget, Premier, you could have done the right thing and changed the path you put us on. We've all stood here sharing stories of the pain you're inflicting on families throughout Ontario. And we also heard from the rating agencies, the Ontario Chamber of Commerce, Canadian Federation of Independent Business, and especially the Auditor General, all warning that you're headed in the wrong direction. So what do you do? More of the same, more spending, more debt. You continue to use the province's credit card instead of a debit card. Premier, why do you continue to make it harder for Ontarians Question. to pay their bills? Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I, you know, we have a fundamental disagreement with the party opposite. Yeah. The party opposite who ran on a plan to begin by cutting and slashing across government, yeah, Mr. Speaker. We uh, said from the beginning that was not our intention. We said that we were going to build this province up, Mr. Speaker. We said we were going to make investments, and that is exactly what we are doing. We are investing in infrastructure, Mr. Speaker. We are investing in transit and roads and bridges. We are investing in people's future in terms of their skill development, Mr. Speaker, youth employment, Mr. Speaker. We know that if we don't make those investments now, we will not have that economic future of which we're capable, Mr. Speaker. So I understand that the, uh, the party opposite doesn't support that philosophy, doesn't support the fact that we need to build the province up and at the same time eliminate the deficit, yes, Mr. Sir. Speaker. We're on track to do that. We've beaten our targets every year, Mr. Speaker. We're going to continue to do this Thank in you. a balanced and moderate way, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, uh, Premier. Your budget isn't just more of the same. In many instances, it's actually a re-announcement from last year. Take that investment in infrastructure you just spoke of. It was actually word for word in last year's budget, except last year you only needed $3 billion from asset sales to make it work. Now it needs the sale of the GM shares. $9 billion from the sale of Hydro One, the LCBO headquarters, the OPG building. It needs all those now to suddenly make it work. Order. You're selling the public assets to pay for what was already budgeted. It's a shell game. You're really using the money from the sale of Hydro One to reduce your deficit. And without the hydro revenue, you are going to be increasing hydro rates to pay off the mortgage. Yeah. Premier, why do you Question. continue to increase our hydro bills to pay for your mistakes? Yeah. Thank you. So, Mr. Speaker, let me just let me just take on a couple of the aspects of what the uh, member opposite have said, both of which are on, on not accurate, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the fact is that we are we are committed to and were committed to. We ran in the election and we put in our budget last year, Mr. Speaker, that we were going to review the assets of this province that were owned by the people of Ontario to make sure that we could leverage them to invest in the assets that are needed today, Mr. Speaker. So those dollars that we will realize, Mr. Speaker, through the opening of the ownership of Hydro One will go into transit, transportation infrastructure that is much needed in this province. And Mr. Speaker, I would say to the member opposite that he is a member of a party that sold the 407 in a fire sale that assured no investment for the people of Ontario, Mr. Speaker, Answer. that put no controls in place in terms of the ongoing regulation of that asset, Mr. Speaker, all of which are a model of Thank how you. not to do it, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Uh, Premier, the reviews uh, on your budget are in, and they're not pretty. Moody's offered two words, considerable risk. Others are claiming a, quote, deteriorating fiscal position. Another said it was, quote, lacking in detail. The worst thing was your chart on page 199. It's the same fake chart that was disclosed in the legislature last year. The fake chart where your own ministry says the fake numbers were, quote, never a real expectation and it was a deliberate policy. They were, quote, notional targets and there was no plans to deliver on them. You used the chart again. You guys couldn't even make up a new fake chart. <laughs> Premier, why do you continue to use these fake numbers Question. that make it so difficult for families in Ontario? Well, Mr. Speaker, you know, it's interesting because what gets said here in the legislature isn't necessarily what gets said 
back at home. So the real numbers that Remember we are using Leeds, are Leeds, numbers Leeds. that the uh, member opposite used, apparently. Premier, right after I admonish, you carry on second time. The member from Etobicoke North will come to order. Carry on. This is the general pattern, Mr. Speaker. Uh, you know, apparently on April 20th uh, of this year, so very, very recently, Mr. Speaker, uh, the member for Nipissing talking about health grants awarded. Three local health organizations will receive a total of $46,400 in one-time funding for the 2014 funding year. These funds, recently announced by Nipissing MPP Vic Fideli, will go toward mental health and replacement reserve costs associated with supportive housing services in Nipissing. Mr. Speaker, the member opposite knows member full well Stormont, that if order. we are going to have Answer. a healthy society, we have to make investments to support people and support communities. He's happy about that in North Bay, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. I think he should understand that that starts here. Thank you. Stop the <laughs> you see that, please? You see that, please? Thank you. New question. The member from Nipissing. Uh, to the Premier, please don't add those people to the 94 health care workers, including nurses you've already fired in North Bay. Here, here. Last week, when asked about the budget, the Premier said, quote, We don't believe right now that taking more money out of people's pockets would be responsible. But she is. Speaker, I was in the lockup. I spent seven hours reading the budget. Speaker, I don't know if the Premier read her own budget, if she thinks it isn't filled with schemes to take more money out of people's pockets. The budget included a payroll tax, a cap-and-trade tax on everything, a beer tax, another installment on the aviation fuel tax, increased user fees and increased hydro rates. Premier, which of those isn't taking more money out of people's pockets? Premier. Speaker, you know, the member it needs to decide what his line of argument is, Mr. Speaker. He needs to decide, A, whether he believes that it's important that we make investments like infrastructure. And what I said, it'll stay that way. Carry on. Like infrastructure, like transit, like roads and bridges, like health care, Mr. Speaker, or whether he believes that we should go, just go straight from on Stormont, and we should order, slash time. across government and eliminate the deficit sooner than 2017-18, which is what we're on track to do, Mr. Speaker. Or the third option is he could look at the complexity of the problems that we are confronting as a society. He could understand that we are in a transition in this province in terms of our economy and that we need to create a business climate that helps businesses to to locate here and help them to expand. He would then Answer. understand that we need to make those investments in infrastructure that will allow communities to thrive. That is the third path, Mr. Thank Speaker. We're, help we're happy to have his support. Thank you. Supplementary. Premier, our caucus had uh, five budget asks designed to make life better for the people of Ontario. Stop your payroll tax as it will put a burden on business and cost us jobs. Don't adopt your cap and trade tax as it hurts families by putting a tax on everything. Fix home care by reducing the number of agencies patients must deal with. Make hydro more affordable as it's chasing away business and causing families to choose between food and fuel, whether to heat or eat. And we asked you to present a serious, credible, detailed plan to balance the budget. You chose to ignore this advice and continue with your tax and spend Member scheme. From Beaches, East York, Premier, will you admit, admit your budget will make it harder for Ontarians to pay? Question. Thank you. Well, Mr. Speaker. Let me just let me just be clear with the member opposite that and and just to look at at what he is saying in terms of those asks he's saying don't deal with climate change don't do our part Mr. Speaker he's saying spend more on health care Mr. Speaker and he's saying don't make the investments in transit and transportation infrastructure that we need to make Mr. Speaker and he's not acknowledging Mr. Speaker that we are in fact on track to eliminate the deficit. I'll just read from what Don Drummond said, Mr. Speaker, what he said, and I know that Don Drummond is someone the, uh, the party opposite has quoted many, many times, and here's what he said, and I quote, the 2015 budget's plan to restore fiscal balance by 2017-18 is credible. The 2012 commission saw tremendous potential for extracting savings while maintaining and even improving the quality of services by changing the way they were being delivered. The budget offers many examples of commission recommendations the government is following. I would Answer. think he could, he could sign up for that, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. 
Final supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Like uh, most MPPs, I too was home this past weekend. I ran into a guy that I know who has owned a manufacturing shop in North Bay for years. He told me that if things don't pick up, he's going to close and leave the province for other work. A lot of that going around. At a community dinner, a municipal councillor said to me, Vic, it's like the air is coming out of our economy. At a function yesterday, a woman who moved to BC said she's Minister been following what's happening in Ontario and can't believe Second what time, has Minister of Finance. Province. Premier, this is what people are feeling all across Ontario. Taxes are going up all around them. Hydro rates continue to skyrocket. People, when people Premier, when people are suffering all around you, why do you continue to take more out of their pockets? Thank you. Premier. Speaker, well, you know, the member opposite ran on a plan to fire 100,000 people as their first action, That's Mr. Speaker. But I would say to the member opposite, I take from what he said that he would be very supportive of the fact that we have made permanent the Northern Industrial Energy Rate yeah, Plan, Mr. Absolutely. Speaker. I would take that he has and supports the notion of expanding and adding to our Jobs and Prosperity Fund, Mr. Speaker, yeah. and making the forestry, forestry industry yeah, eligible forestry. for those yeah. funds, Mr. Absolutely. Speaker, that he would understand that we're doing that because we recognize that forestry is coming back, but that we need to partner with forestry businesses, Mr. Speaker, to make sure that they have a future in Northern yeah, Ontario. I think that if he is concerned about the manufacturing and the jobs in the North, Mr. Speaker, he would be very very supportive of those initiatives, all of Answer. which are included in our budget, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Your question, the leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. The Premier insists that the only way to invest in transit and transportation is to sell off Hydro One. It's just not true. Selling Hydro One funds less than 3 per cent of the Liberal transit and infrastructure promise. Yet again, the Premier is making the wrong choice, and families will pay the price. The Premier is busily selling the foolish notion to Ontarians that the only way to have infrastructure is to sell a strategic asset that makes them money each and every year. Does the Premier actually believe her own spin, Speaker? Premier. Mr. Speaker, here's what I believe. If we do not make the investments in transportation and transit in needed now, Mr. Speaker. If we don't start those investments now, in fact, continue on the work that we have been doing since 2003, Mr. Speaker, and make that ongoing, then we will not have the infrastructure that is needed in order for our economy to grow. Now, I understand that the leader of the third party is going to be doing a tour of the province, Mr. Speaker, and she's going to be talking in communities about the plan that we have put on the table. I hope, Mr. Speaker, that in those same speeches, she explains how she would build transit and how she would build transit transportation infrastructure, Mr. Speaker, without making the decisions that we are making. Because so far, Mr. Speaker, she ran on the plan that we ran on, and she hasn't put any alternatives forward. So I look forward to her explanation, Mr. Speaker. Appreciate it, please. You see that, please? Thank you. Perhaps the Premier should listen up, Speaker. The Premier says she needs to find $400 million per year. At most, that's 3 per cent of what's needed for her promises. But she will not close HST loopholes that give away nearly billions annually, Speaker. She will not end the waste that happens with P3s, billions of dollars, Speaker. She brags about Ontario's combined corporate tax rate being less than that of Alabama, but she won't look at that either. Speaker. She seems to think the only answer is to sell off Hydro One. It's the wrong decision. Can the Premier explain why Ontarians Remember should pay Trinity the price Spadina, for another order. one of her wrong decisions? Thank you, Premier. Speaker. <laughs> The fact is that we are doing a number of things, and the member opposite knows full well that we are pulling on a number of levers in order to have the resources. We are raising, we are raising taxes, Mr. Speaker. In fact, in the last two budgets, we're from we Hamilton have raised, East, Stony taxes. Creek. We have raised taxes on individuals at the upper end of the income scale, Mr. Speaker. We have raised taxes on jet fuel. We have uh, portioned a section, a portion of the uh, HST and gas tax, Mr. Speaker, to invest in transit and transportation infrastructure. The fact is, Mr. Speaker. 
we cannot borrow endlessly. That is what the that is what the NDP would like to see, Mr. Speaker. They would like to see us just rack up debt, Mr. Speaker, and they don't want to work with the private sector. The leader of the third party has said she doesn't trust the private sector on anything. We trust the private sector to create jobs, Mr. Answer. Speaker. We trust the private sector to work in partnership with us, Mr. Speaker. And we know that if we don't make investments today, we won't have a thriving economy yeah. tomorrow, Mr. Speaker. Speaker the fact of the matter is that this Premier does not have a mandate to sell off hydro. And she does not need to sell off Hydro One. Selling off Hydro One is wrong for families. It is wrong for Ontario. And once it is gone, it is gone forever. There are no do-overs when it comes to the sell-off of Hydro One. The Premier has no mandate. She has no good reason to sell off Hydro One. So can she explain exactly why it is that she's choosing to do so? Thank you. Go over this again because I know this is something that uh, we're going to need to talk about over the coming weeks because it is—it's a—it's a complex issue. The fact is, we have assets in this province that we have built up over years, Mr. Speaker. They were assets that were needed in the 20th century and in the 19th century, and we need to make sure that we have the assets that are needed in the 21st century. That's right. So what Ed Clark and his group have said to us is, you know what? Take that asset that was built up years ago, and and. Retain ownership of 40% of that asset, Mr. Speaker, but use the use the income that you can get from the other portion of that asset, Mr. Speaker, to invest in infrastructure that are need, that's needed today. But what we said was we have to have some controls in place. The regulatory regime, the price setting regime, Answer. Mr. Speaker, those remain in place as well as de facto control of the board, Mr. Speaker. The member opposite Thank neglects you. those parts of the plan. Thank you. No question. The leader of the third party. The question is also for the Premier Speaker. The Liberals still have not learned right from wrong, and it's families that are going to be paying the price, Speaker. The Premier and her friends don't seem to have any problem finding billions to pay for corruption and scandal, but at once, when it comes to paying for much-needed transit and transportation, they're making the wrong decision again. Selling off hydro isn't maximizing, Speaker. It's not repurposing. It's not optimizing. It is a fire sale, plain and simple. Will the Premier just pull the plug today? Thank you, Premier. Mr. Speaker, selling off the 407 was a fire sale, and that was the model that we looked at and we said, we're not doing that. There's no way we're going to sell an asset and, and, and rob the people of Ontario of any future value, Mr. Speaker. There's no way that we're going to undervalue an asset and sell it off, Mr. Speaker. So we're doing it in a very, very thoughtful way, Mr. Speaker. We understand that the investment in infrastructure, in roads and bridges and transit, is critical. If we don't do that, Mr. Speaker, then we will not have the thriving economy that we know we're all capable of. And so, Mr. Speaker, we've put those protections in place, and we are going to make. Much better. Supple Selling Hydro One is wrong, right. and the people of this province will pay the price, Speaker. It is going to kill jobs. It is going to hurt families. It pays for less than 3 per cent of what's needed for her transit prom promises. And Once the Liberals start Ontario down this road, there is no going back, Speaker. Will the Premier do the right thing by the people of this province and pull the plug on this wrong-headed plan? <laughs> It's very interesting, Mr. Speaker, that the party of Labour <laughs> is at odds with the Labour that works for Hydro One, Mr. Speaker. The Power Workers Union support keeping the company together, Mr. Speaker. That's how they see the strong jobs continuing, Mr. Speaker. So, I say to the member opposite that we are making a difficult decision. I will, I will give it to her that it is a difficult decision, but we're making a decision that's not ideological, Mr. Speaker. We're looking at the problem. The problem is we need funds to invest in transit and transportation infrastructure. We need that money immediately, Mr. Speaker, because if we don't make those investments, we are not going to be able to have that infrastructure in place for the people of Ontario. And we are not tied by, by an ideology that says never change, never do anything differently, yes, never learn from the past. We're doing all those things and we're making these investments, Mr. Yeah, Speaker. Thank you. 
Speaker, the Premier is selling off Hydro One, but she won't even say the word, Speaker. It's not optimization. It's not unlocking value. It's not maximization. So let's, fi let's finish with a really basic question, Speaker. If the Premier is so convinced that it's what Ontarians Member want, and if she is so proud to do what even Mike Harris wouldn't dare to do, why is she embarrassed to use the words selling Hydro One and privatizing Hydro One? <laughs> Mr. Speaker, again, I have I have said, and I you know I talked to people I talked to people over the weekend, and I said, yeah, we are going to open the ownership that uh, broaden the ownership. That means that means we are going to sell off in uh, in tranches, Mr. Speaker. We're going to we're going to put out a, a 15 percent uh, uh, sale, Mr. Speaker, to start out with to see what the market is. We're going to do this in a very very careful way. No single entity will own more than 10 percent, Mr. Speaker. The government will retain control of 40 percent, Mr. Speaker, and there will be protections of the regulation of the electricity system and the regulation of price controls. Those will, re will remain in place, Mr. Speaker. So we. We've been very, very thoughtful about this. It's a difficult decision, but you know what's more difficult, yes, Mr. Speaker, is imagining a future in this province without the investments in infrastructure that are necessary. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question today is for the uh, Minister of Education. Uh, Minister, uh, 5,000 more students are not in the classroom today. Hmm. Students in the Rainbow Board join their fellow students in Durham wanting to learn and wanting to get back to school. Minister, that's 5,000 more families worried about their children. Ontarians can't afford your lack of leadership any longer. This is clearly not a local issue as you insist it is. This boils down to your years of fiscal mismanagement. Over a decade, 12 years you've been in power. Minister, will you get these students back in the classroom and give them the education they deserve? Thank you. Minister of Education. Thank you, Speaker. And, and we believe firmly in negotiated collective agreements. That means that we need to be negotiating collective agreements at the central table. And I want to assure the member that, in fact, we continue to work with the mediator and uh, we continue to work at negotiating at the central table because we understand that the only way that we're ever going to resolve this is to get local agreements. Now, I also understand that both school boards, both the Durham Board and the Rainbow Board, have made, been very, very clear that they are available to negotiate at the local level. And I Answer. Would, uh, I would very much encourage the local unions to get back to the local table as well. Thank you. Supplementary. Minister, a whole lot of nothing. think about a grade 12 student in a calculus class. How will they be prepared for a university math class next year? Ontario students can't afford to be out of President the country. Board. They can't afford your lack of leadership. Board by board, more children will be hurt and you are causing nothing but damage to their educational experience. Students are now suffering, and I say it again, Mr. Speaker, because of your years and years of fiscal mismanagement. Minister, how many more boards need to strike before you show leadership and stop blaming local issues? Thank you. Minister. I'm not quite sure what the member uh, thinks we can do other than negotiate, but what I do know is what their suggestion was. Their platform was that they were going to fire 100,000 public servants, and when we did the math, that worked out to 22,700 workers in Ontario school boards. That was their platform. I don't think that would get you labor peace, firing 22,700 people. I actually think the way to get labour peace is to negotiate collective agreements. And I also believe that this is a, something that we need to do both locally, and I understand that the boards are yes, at the table, and centrally, and I assure you that central negotiations continue. Thank you. Question, the member from Toronto, Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. My question to the Premier. The Premier wants to hide behind the words optimization and rationalization, but she won't out and say it, that she's selling hydro to Bay Street for a quick buck. 
That's what you're doing, Premier. Privatization is a big deal. It will completely change our hydro system. And once the Premier sells Hydro One, there is no going back. But the Premier kept Ontarians in the dark last summer about her plans. Why did the Premier keep Ontarians in the dark about her plans to sell Hydro One? Good question. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, the member opposite knows full well that we ran on a plan to review the assets of this province. Mr. Speaker, we were, we were very clear about it. We were clear about it in our platform. Thank you. Finish, please. We were clear about it in our budget, Mr. Speaker, and people knew that uh, Ed Clark was going to be uh, was going to be leading that uh, process, Mr. Speaker. You know, the member opposite lives in a riding where people very much understand the need to invest in transit, Mr. Speaker, and they understand the needs that because they are seeing the congestion in their own communities, Mr. Speaker. So I would say to the member opposite. What would your plan be? Because the fact is that you ran on the plan that we put forward, Mr. Speaker, and the fact is that you are now saying, well, you don't go for that Answer. plan, but you haven't presented an alternative, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, you don't sell your house to build a fence around your property. But going back, <laughs> keeping people in the dark, the Premier is pushing the Ontario Ombudsman out of Hydro One. She's pulling the drapes on the sunshine list. She's ending freedom of information at Hydro One. She's getting rid of transparency from the Financial Accountability Office. The Premier didn't run on this plan. She doesn't have a mandate to privatize Hydro One, and now she's making it less transparent and less accountable. This is the wrong decision. This is the wrong decision, and Ontarians will pay the price. Why did the Premier say maximizing value of hydro when we, she really was planning to sell hydro? Yeah. Mr. Speaker, uh, you know, in terms of, in terms of what, uh, what we had put in front of the people of Ontario, let me just quote from the May 20, 2014 budget, not the one that started with, as I was the saying, first the, first the first one. Um, on page 20, it said, the government will look at maximizing and unlocking value from assets it currently holds, including real estate holdings, as well as crown corporations Crown's such as Ontario Power Generation, Hydro One, and the Liquor Control we Board of Ontario, on. Mr. Speaker. We ran on that. And then the platform, Mr. Speaker, our platform said, and I quote, our moving Ontario forward plan includes a balanced and responsible approach to paying for these investments. The funds will be dedicated will be from dedicated sources of revenue, asset optimization, $3.15 billion or 10.9 per cent. That's what we ran on, Mr. Speaker, and that's what we're doing. Thank you. My question is for the Minister for Francophone Affairs. Madam Minister, you know that I'm proud to live in a growing Francophone community. And a few months ago, I had the privilege to attend the opening of a French school in my community. In December of last year, the government announced the fact that the government will be celebrating the 400th anniversary of the French presence in Ontario. Essentially, what this is, it's been 400 years since Samuel de Champlain visited Ontario. It is therefore a very historic moment. Could you update us on the activities with respect to these celebrations? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I'm very impressed by the quality of the French from the member from Etobicoke Centre. So yes, last week we had the pleasure, Mr. Speaker, to announce financing for 62 projects with a total of $1.14 million. You'll remember that last December, the Premier announced in Sudbury financing for celebrating these events. We launched the program with respect to the celebration of the 400th anniversary of the French presence in Ontario in order to help municipalities celebrate this event. I'm happy to say that we've received a total of 110 applications. We evaluated them based on the nature of the project, its financial 
impact as well as the, influ the effect on tourism in the riding, I will say to the member of Nipissing that his community will receive nearly $50,000 to celebrate the uh, celebrations of the 40th anniversary. Merci, Madame la thank you, Madam Minister, and I thank you for your enthusiasm with respect to this subject. I'm happy to participate, or to be part of, rather, a province where we recognize our diversity. This, in this case, the richness of Francophone culture. I heard you mention that there were 62 approved projects. Could you share more details on these projects? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. In the $1.4 million envelope, there are 62 projects there throughout the province, 21 in central Ontario, 23 in the east, 13 in the north, and 5 in the west. These projects are very diverse and organized by Francophone groups, Francophiles, Anglophones, First Nations, as well as newly arrived Ontarians. There are various types of events, art galleries, galas, um, various other events, and I was, what I must remind you is that all of the projects are open and inclusive, and I invite all members of the Assembly to participate in them. In the August long weekend, there will be a big celebration, and we will reproduce the 300th anniversary celebrations that happened in 1921 for the 300th anniversary. Why not? Why didn't we do them in 1915? It was because of the war. So we're going to reproduce these 300th anniversary celebrations during the 400th anniversary celebrations. Thank you very much, Speaker. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. Premier, last week, just one day after your budget, Goodyear announced that it would shutter a $500 million plant expansion in Napanee. Their explanation was simple. The soaring costs and the unreliability of electricity has made it too risky to invest in Ontario. Instead, they have chosen, like so many others manufacturers, to choose Mexico over the win Ontario. That's 1,000 new jobs and half a billion dollars in, in investment leaving Ontario. Yeah. Premier, will you finally admit that your failed economic policies and hydro policies are driving jobs, yeah. prosperity, and investment Question. out of our province? Thank you. Well, Mr. Speaker, I would say to the member opposite that it's, uh, it's an interesting commentary given that, uh, that we are the uh, number one uh, jurisdiction for foreign direct investment at this moment, go. Mr. Speaker. We've seen $4 billion worth of investment in the auto sector, Mr. Speaker, over the last six months. That's not to say, that's not to say that there isn't more to do. I completely understand that. And whenever there's a, whenever the, there's a plant that shuts down and there are jobs that are lost, Mr. Speaker, that's very, very hard on a community. It's hard on individuals. It's hard on a family. But, Mr. Speaker, we have to continue to work with businesses to bring them here, to create the, to create the environment, a reliable Prince Edward energy system. Mr. Speaker, which the member opposite will remember in 2003, we did not have an, a reliable electricity system. The member from Leeds Grenville is warned. One sentence wrap up, please. We needed to rebuild the electricity system that we inherited in 2003. We've done that, Mr. Speaker. It is reliable. Mr. Speaker, I, I think the Premier's math and stats teachers must have been on strike as well in her final year. Goodyear has spoken with Hydro One and your government for months on end, Premier, to find a solution to your unreliable electricity system. It's now clear your government has not found a solution and in, instead has driven another world-class business, another $500 million investment, another 1,000 new jobs out of our province. You speak constantly about the investments you are making, but clearly the private sector doesn't believe you. They are speaking and voting with their feet and their wallets, Premier, and investing capital and jobs anywhere but Ontario. Premier, it's time to be Question. honest and to come clean with the people of Ontario. When and how will you fix your broken hydro system? Okay. Mr. Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The fact of the matter is, Mr. Speaker, 
the operations that the member is speaking about, they're not closing. The member from fact, they're not expanding as well. And that's the issue. We need to find more ways to incite and encourage companies to invest in Ontario. That is why the member opposite should support the budget that we brought forward. It talks a lot about how we can provide for greater incentives for companies to invest in Ontario. And in fact, the member, the, the minister responsible for economic development and trade, is now at the Great Lakes regions talking about the things that Ontario does to provide for greater exports and greater manufacturing. Member from Prince Edward Hastings is warned. Wrap up. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And as a result, we've increased the Jobs and Prosperity Fund by another $200 million more to create those incentives. And we, are, we have created now over a half a million net new jobs Answer. in the province of Ontario since the recession, including in regions that the member talks about. And we will continue to support industry. Thank you. The member from Lanark will come to order. New question. The member from Windsor West. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Premier, today secondary school teachers in Northern Ontario's Rainbow District School Board joined Durham teachers in standing up to this government's plan to force school closures, cut education and flip-flop on its commitment to keep class sizes manageable. Last week, elementary teachers announced that they will be in a legal strike position on May 10. While this government continues to dodge responsibility for mishandling our educational sector, an estimated 26,000 students are missing class and 2,400 teachers are now on the picket line. With teachers on strike, students out of school and parents across Ontario wondering whether or not their high school seniors will be going off to college or university this fall, will the Premier finally take responsibility Question. for the government's cuts to education? Thank you, Premier. Education. Minister of Education. Yes, and uh, I, I must say the NDP is nothing if not persistent. Uh, they really do have trouble with the definition of the word cut. So let me say once again, if you have $22.5 billion in education funding last year, and you have $22.5 billion in education funding this year, that is not a cut, that is stable funding. But I want to tell and less students, so it's actually more per student. But I want to talk about some of the capital because the accusation is that somehow we've been uh, stingy with capital money. We have invested $12.9 billion in school infrastructure since 2003. We have constructed 725 new schools and more than 700 yes, additions and renovations. We've put aside $750 million for school consultants and we've doubled the funding for school renewals. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, again to the Premier. Speaker, the Liberal government continues to deny any cuts to education in Ontario. Along with ignoring inflation, last week this government actually announced their plans to spend $248 million less in education in 2014-2015 than it originally promised. That is nearly that is nearly a $250 million in-year cut to education this year alone. All the while, the Liberals are telling Ontario families that edu education funding in this province is stable. If a freeze isn't a cut, and a cut isn't a cut, can the Premier please explain what she thinks is a cut to funding? Thank you. Minister? Yes, and, and I'd be quite happy to explain what happened because, in fact, there there is a there is a uh, impact of having declining enrollment. Yeah. So that means that we need to spend less money for more students. What that's actually allowed us to do is to reinvest in the students that are there. As I've said hundreds of times, I think we don't believe in investing in empty space. Order. We believe in investing investing in the students that are there, actually there. So what we have done is actually increased Let's carry on. So what has actually happened this year, Speaker, is in fact we are just flowing the same amount of money as in yes, last sir. year's GSN, but what it means is we are spending more money per pupil. And that is true in both Europe. Thank you. New question. The member from Burlington. 
Merci, Monsieur le Président. Ma question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Ministry of Correctional Services and Community Security. And the violent crime rate has dropped by 27 percent. But despite this, in many communities across our province, the cost of policing continues to rise. Part of the reason for this is because many individuals and families are confronted with issues that require broader solutions than a simple emergency response. I see this in my own riding of Burlington, where we are ably served by the Halton Regional Police Service. Problems like elder abuse, domestic violence and addiction need a comprehensive strategy to address their root cause. As a result, it is incumbent on our province to help communities find solutions to problems that confront them in order to reduce the cost of emergency services and ultimately produce lasting results. Mr. Speaker, through you, Question. can the minister please explain what solution he proposes to better address the social issues that confront municipalities and frontline responders in order to reduce the demand for emergency services? Thank you, Mr. Minister Speaker. Minister of Community Safety and Personal Services. Thank you, Speaker. I want to thank the member from Burlington for asking a very important question in this House today, Speaker. Speaker, as we work uh, to build stronger, safer, and healthier communities right across Ontario, one of the key challenges is how to address social issues at, at their root. In other words, addressing chronic issues in our communities. Often we think of our response to crime, safety, and health emergencies in terms of police, fire, and paramedics. These services are extremely important, but we also need to look at proactive community engagement to address the causes of social issues and reduce the cost of emergency responses in our communities. To do this, Speaker, we must bring a variety of groups to the table. Speaker, that is the aim of our Community Safety Hub model. A Community Safety Hub would be made up of community and social service providers from fields such as healthcare, education, Answer. addiction, policing, probation, and justice workers, children's services, and First Nation issues. These te team members, Speaker, work together Thank and you. find a collaborative approach to solve issues in the community. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for that response. Residents in my riding are pleased to see that you are proposing a model for community safety that will serve to better address social issues, not just in my community of Burlington, in fact, but right across our province. This could also help to reduce the number of calls for emergency services, which will play an important part in containing costs. But, Mr. Speaker, if the hub model is being proposed by the province, it risks becoming a one-size-fits-all solution, which would ultimately be ineffective. Without bringing people together, the right team of community members to address the wide variety of social issues confronting individuals and family in our province, it would be impossible to create lasting improvements. After all, the social issues that members of my community face are not the same as the ones that confront different communities across our province. Mr. Speaker, through you, can the minister please explain to the legislature Question. how the hub model will be effective across the province with Ontarians facing such a wide variety of issues? Thank minister. you, Mr. Speaker. Raise a very important point, and that's that's the incredible thing about community safety hub. That in order for them to be effective, uh, they have to uh, uh, be developed by the individual communities, so that issues confronting them are front and center is being uh, being set. Uh, uh, by them. And I'm pleased to say, uh, Speaker, that this approach is already working in, in our communities across the province. Most recently, as the Speaker would know, that uh, Brantford uh, initiated a, a hub within its community, uh, community as well. In fact, recently, the Gateway Hub in Nipissing was recognized for its innovative approach to building a safer and healthier community by the Ontario Municipal Social Services Association. Partners in Nipissing's Gateway Hub are working together in the community to identify high-risk individuals or families and helping them to achieve healthier Answer. and safer lifestyle. This will lead to lasting outcomes while reducing the demand on emergency services. We are working with other ministries as well to make sure that these hubs work Thank effectively you. across the province. Thank you. Your question, the member from Bruce Gray, Owen Sound. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. 140,000 new patients enter Ontario's health care system every year. More patients means more resources are needed. Your minister has said time and again, and I quote, we are and will be increasing our funding to health care. Yet, when the federal Conservatives increased their health transfer by $652 million, you put only $598 into that health care. Premier, can you tell the people of Ontario where $54 million health care dollars were funneled? Yep, people want to know. 
Mr. Health and Long-Term Care. Mr. Of health and long-term care. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And the member opposite uh, knows, having uh, looked at the budget, that our health care expenditures for uh, this year and next year and following years uh, will be increasing. It will be increasing in part to reflect the growing population and the changing demographics of this province, but it will be increasing to allow us to invest in those important areas where we need to. At, for example, in home and community care, where we made the commitment uh, a couple of years ago, in fact, in 2013, where we we would increase by 5 per cent each year the investment in home and community care. We have been doing that for a number of years. We're continuing to do that into the future as well. But, Mr. Speaker, I, uh, I think the member opposite will appreciate uh, some of the comments uh, from our stakeholders, and I'd be happy to uh, reference some of those in the supplementary uh, in terms of their reflections on Answer. the investments that we're making as detailed. Member from Welland, come to order, please. <laughs> supplementary. Well, I'll try back to the Premier again, Mr. Speaker. You love to bash the federal government, but when they pull through, pull through, you can't admit it. Your current funding levels have already resulted in nurses being fired, services being shut down, and CCACs turning away patients. This cut of $54 million Minister in your health budget is the equivalent of 9,000 long-term care beds, home care for 28,000 patients, or 7,000 new nurses. The people of Ontario can't afford your cuts to health care. Premier, what happened to your promise to ensure that you won't cut health care nor compromise patient care or nursing jobs? Good question. Thank you. Well, Mr. Mr. Speaker, the member opposite does know that we're not cutting health care. In fact, the opposite is true. We're in increasing it this year. We've outlined that in the budget. As we've been increasing the health care budget every year since 2003 when we first came into office, Mr. Speaker, and I want to say, you know, one of the items that I'm most proud of that's in the budget that hasn't got a lot of it, hasn't got any attention, I think, thus far that I want to reference, and I'm going to quote Dr. Dave Williams from the Ontario Health Innovation Council, and his quote is, the Ontario Health Innovation Council is thrilled with the announcement of the creation of the $20 million Health Innovation Fund. This will ensure that Ontario will become a fertile ground for the development of innovative health technologies that will create economic growth and value in the system. Mr. Speaker, we have uh, the Ontario Home Care Association Answer. as well talking about how pleased they are with the budget yeah. because we know it will help us to serve more Ontarians and keep them safe and independent at home. New question. The leader of the third party. Speaker, on, uh, my question is to the Premier. On Friday, I was in Thunder Bay to host a roundtable on health care, spoke to many people in different parts of the uh, frontline services, and what I heard was absolutely appalling. Since the beginning of the year, there have been regularly more, than, more patients than available beds. Uh, in fact, uh, this was the case for about 28 straight days, almost a month, at Thunder Bay Health Sciences Centre. 28 beds have been closed at the geriatric unit, and 11 RPN positions have been cut. Why is this pre Premier refusing to take responsibility for the mess her short-sighted cuts have made to the health care system, not only in Thunder Bay, Speaker, but across our province? Thank you. Mr. Health and Long-Term Care. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And we know that we've had challenges in Thunder Bay at the hospital there and in the community, and we addressed those uh, last year with, to the satisfaction of the hospital and the, the Lynn and the, uh, th those engaged in the healthcare sector in S Thunder Bay. But there is more work to be done, and we'll continue that to do that important work uh, uh, in Thunder Bay as we do across the province. But it's important, Mr. Speaker, that we also, when we reference the changes in healthcare, that we stick to the facts. And I have to get back to Lake Ridge Health and the the the. Uh, the comment that was made by the opposition critic last week, because I actually have in my hands now the letter uh, from the CEO and the president from Kevin Empey from Lake Ridge Health, uh, who responds specifically to the erroneous, I would describe based on the letter, the erroneous comments that were made in the legislature last week. And he talks yes, about. Mr. Speaker, he says it was with great disappointment that I read in Hansard, he's speaking to France, uh, rather the member from uh, Nickel Belt, uh, that I read in Hansard your comments Thank about you. our hospital, particularly the services. Sorry, your question? Oh, sorry. Sorry, supplement. With the introduction of the right wing Mike Harris style budget the Liberals announced on Thursday, the people of the North and across the province can only expect more health care services to become worse. The hospital is already facing six million dollar order. Sorry for the interruption. Carry on. 
I used to like Mike Harris. Uh, the hospital is already facing a $6 million budget deficit. There is no doubt that further cuts, which are in that budget, will come to nurses and other frontline workers. Nurses are being forced to provide care in hallways, Speaker, due to constant gridlock in that hospital. Patient care is at risk. Why is this government attempting to balance the books on the backs of patients in the Thunder Bay Hospital and around this Question. province? Minister. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And the member opposite knows that uh, we're transforming our health care system, and we're not cutting health care; we're increasing it. But the uh, the critic for health, uh, the member for Nickelback last week, as uh, I'm quoting from the letter, uh, Nickelback. Nickelback. <laughs> yeah. Well. The, uh, the member referenced, so this is the letter from uh, the president of Lake Ridge Health speaking uh, to the member. You referenced human resource adjustments made in our laboratory program and said they are having a negative impact on patients in our cancer center. I wish you had phoned me first to verify the details because the assertion above is demonstrably inaccurate. First, the people. The implication is that people were recently put out of a job and that is false. Nobody was let go. Second, the quality of care. You asserted these changes in our laboratory program are having a devastating impact on the quality of care yes, offered at our cancer centre. And this cancer centre has regularly ranked in the top three in the province since 2012, Mr. Speaker. The letter goes on. Thank you. I uh, just want to remind the Deputy House Leader he's not allowed to do drive-by heckling. New question, the member from Kitchener Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Ontario is home to about 71 million hectares of forest and about 85 billion trees. Our forests provide both environmental and economic benefits to our province. They support jobs, absorb carbon, and provide habitat to a variety of species that call Ontario home. Now, to protect our forests and ensure public safety, each spring, we prepare for the forest fire season. We've heard reports that the first fires of the year are already happening in northwestern Ontario. Fighting forest fires, we can all agree, is a top priority for our government. Mr. Speaker, could the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry please explain to this House what his ministry is doing to ensure Ontario is prepared to respond to potential Question. forest fire emergencies in 2015? Thank you. Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Thank you very much, and I want to thank the, uh, the member for the question. It is already, believe it or not, forest fire fighting season, uh, certainly in northern Ontario and across much of the rest of the province. It's here, and we need to uh, make sure the communities uh, that are represented by this service know that we are, in fact, prepared. Uh, Ontario's fire program, Speaker, is recognized around the world for its ability to prepare for and respond to risks related to public safety and the protection of our natural resources. Speaker, hiring of Ontario fire rangers began earlier this month, and other required preparedness activities are already underway, including training and equipment checks in anticipation of wildland fire activity. By early May, we will have a full complement of over 760 trained MNRF firefighters and, Speaker, a further 300. 20 firefighters available from the private sector to assist Answer. us as required. In addition, we have nine heavy water bombers, three twin otter medium water bombers, 13 initial attack helicopters, seven bird dog Thank aircraft, you. and eight, ten, and ten fire. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for his response and his dedication to ensuring Ontario is prepared for the forest fire season. Speaker, last week our government introduced the 2015 budget, our plan for building Ontario up. In response, the leader of the third party made some very startling accusations. She told the Sudbury Star, and I quote, emergency force firefighting is being cut. In 2012-13, it had a budget of $180 million. Then it went down to $79.4 million. Now it's going down to $69.8 million." Unquote. These numbers are very startling, and many Ontarians who heard that quote from the leader of the third party might be led to believe that our province is reducing our commitment to fighting for Question. Fires. So could the minister please explain to the members of this House exactly how our government funds emergency force fighting? Minister. 
Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the member for the question. And uh, it is important to set the record straight and address the fear mongering by the leader of the third party that's been yeah. going on across yeah. Northern Ontario. Speaker, this is exactly the same approach that the previous leader of the NDP undertook back in 2007. The quote was this: 2012-2013, it had a budget of 180 million. Then it went down to 80. Now it's going down to 69. Well, of course, that was the worst firefighting season probably in the history of Northern Ontario or Ontario as a province. Speaker, the leader of the third party should know, and if she doesn't, she should do a little bit more homework, that there's always a number for emergency force fighting in the budget, and then on an as-needed basis, if you should have a severe forest fire season, you go back, Treasury Board gives you the money overnight, and things happen, and we're ready. Yeah, yeah. Speaker, this is fear-mongering at its worst. The Minister of Health just finished expressing his comments as in terms of what happened with the health care file in Sudbury. Yeah, the leader of the third party did the same thing in Sudbury when it came to emergency forest fire preparedness. This is wrong, fear mongering at its worst, and I felt that. Thank you. Your question? The member from Oxford. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. Premier, under your government, the debt has doubled and the waiting list for social housing has grown to 165. Thousand families. Ontario can't afford to waste social housing dollars. Deputy House That's Leader. Exactly what's happening. Every dollar the Housing Services Corporation spends is a dollar that's intended to build, repair, and operate social housing. It's a public dollar taken from social housing providers by overcharging them for natural gas and insurance. Premier, will you allow social housing providers to opt out of the social housing of the Housing Services Corporation so they can save millions of dollars? For their social housing. Premier? Mr. Municipal Affairs and Housing. Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Well, uh, Speaker, I think we've answered that question a couple of times already, but let me take another uh, stab at it. Uh, the Housing Services Corporation was established uh, by the uh, official opposition when they were actually in government. They uh, put in place a pooling mechanism to service uh, municipalities and to provide savings. Um, that's worked reasonably well, Mr. Speaker. There are some concerns that have been raised uh, by the member opposite, which, which I concur with, and we need to look at those. That's why uh, we initiated some changes uh, with the, uh, the Housing Services Board and are currently undertaking with them an the independent review of their operation. Right? Thank you. Supplementary. Well, my question is back to the Premier, and I would just say to the Minister, not only did you not answer today, you've never answered it before sure. when I asked it. Last week's budget did not contain a single new dollar for social housing. We have put forward a solution that would give housing providers millions more for affordable housing without adding your significantly to your deficit. Simply allowing housing providers to purchase natural gas and insurance at the best price that they can get, rather than forcing them to buy through the Housing Services Corporation. Premier, will you agree to let them opt out so those millions can go to help families in need of social housing? Here, here, here. Thank you. Minister. Well, uh, again, Mr. Speaker, when you talk about housing solutions, uh, their solution in government was to download housing to municipalities. It was. And, and we're, still, we're still working as hard as we can to, to recover from that mess that you created. Order. Order. We're pulling the fire alarm on uh, a fire that they set when they put up the Housing Services Corporation in place. We're going to do this Member right. from Oxford, there are come some to legitimate order. concerns that have been raised, and the member opposite knows we're addressing them. And when the report comes in from the independent consultant, if there are changes that need to be made, you can be sure we'll make them. Oh. Yeah. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. Start the clock. Thank you. The member from Oshawa. Thank you, Speaker. And my question is to the Minister of Labour. Speaker, on February 8, the Durham firefighting student named Adam Brunt lost his life in an accident during unregulated 
private fire safety training. Tragically, this was not an isolated incident, as volunteer firefighter Gary Kendall was killed during the same type of training less than five years before. Following Adam's death, I called on the minister to take action and regulate this industry before another accident occurs. But the response that I have received was nothing but a laundry list of existing legislation that does not apply to these firefighter trainees. Speaker, these were accidents, but if we allow this situation to continue, it becomes neglect. Will the minister take action and commit to regulating the private safety training industry today? Thank you. Thank you, Speaker, and certainly our condolences go out to the families and to the colleagues of the people that were tragically killed as they were, try as they were training to uh, ensure that they had the skills necessary to ensure that when they were called upon to uh, respond as first responders, that they indeed had those skills. They'd taken that training, Speaker. I did receive correspondence from the member opposite, and I tried to provide her, I think, with the best, uh, the best advice that I had received on the best way to proceed with this, Speaker. There's a, number, there's a number of angles to this. Obviously, there's an educational component, there's a labor component, there's a, there's a training colleges and universities component as well, Speaker. So in a number, we're taking it extremely seriously in Order. a number of ways, Speaker. We know that we have to come to grips with this issue in a way that ensures that those people who choose the, to enter Answer. the field of emergency preparedness are indeed able to train in a safe environment. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Tomorrow is the National Day of Mourning. It is a day when we remember those we've lost in workplace accidents and commit to doing everything in our power to prevent future accidents from occurring. Speaker, Adam Brunt was not yet a worker, but he was going to be, and tomorrow his loss will be mourned. Speaker, I will ask again, will the minister commit to regulating the private fire safety training industry before another senseless and preventable loss occurs? Great question. Thank you, Speaker. I do, uh, I do appreciate the member drawing attention to the day is the, uh, the day of mourning for all workers in the province of Ontario and indeed across this country who have lost their lives when they simply went to work in the morning. Speaker, I can tell the, uh, I can tell the member opposite that the issue is still under investigation. The, uh, the incidents that took place in the, uh, the last incident, certainly the details are being investigated in the way they should. We are working with training, and, uh, training colleges and universities, Speaker, to see what more can be done. As I said, we need to, the, these individuals need to have the best training they can possibly have. We need to ensure that that training is done in as safe a possible environment as we possibly can. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. Point of order, the Minister of uh, Natural Resources and Forestry. Speaker, thank you. I'd like to uh, correct my record. I said earlier when mentioning that I believe the leader of the third party was fear-mongering about forest firefighting, I referenced comments she had made in Sudbury. I meant to say comments she had made in Thunder Bay. Thank you. Thank you. The member from Bramley Gore Malton on a point of order. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I want to introduce in the House, they may still be here, they, some of them may have left, uh, members of the Canadian Beverage Association, Ron Serrano, John O'Leary, Neil Antimus, John Shellion, uh, June Goats, Brandon Ashmore, Carolyn Fell, and Alison Bing. Thank you very much. I suspect deeply that the pri former Prime Minister misses question period. There are, no <laughs> there are no deferred votes. This House stands recess until 1 p.m. this afternoon.